Uh, well, uh, good afternoon. Um, my name is Theo van Broven. I'm uh, um, a uh, professor emeritus of this young university. Uh, but uh, we do already have old people here. Uh, <laughs> but um, uh, it's really a pleasure uh, to see you all because it has been a long day and uh, and we had today a lot of uh, good impressions. Uh, uh, I'm, I've been learning a great deal again, uh, you see, so uh, you, you remain a student all your life. Uh, and uh, so I hope that uh, in, in the same atmosphere uh, we c can make our concluding session now uh, with uh, two eminent uh, uh, experts uh, and um, uh, maybe uh, we will come back to that, but I have been a little bit puzzling about the notion of sovereignty. What is now sovereignty? In, in, and it is being used in, in, in many ways. Uh, also here, uh, uh, when uh, the issue of Brexit came up, uh, it was also called the sovereignty question by those who favor uh, the Brexit. We have similar voices here in the Netherlands uh, who, uh, in fact, uh, uh, would like us to leave the European Union because they think it undermines our sovereignty. So sovereignty, uh, uh, it, it, so maybe we come back to that and, and uh, it needs also a further study of what the sovereignty is. Uh, but anyway, that... Uh, um, now, uh, this morning, we started with uh, uh, the competing titles to sovereignty, and we were uh, a great deal of that, and, and uh, Marcelo's uh, uh, presentation was largely devoted also to looking to the past, looking backwards. Now, the, of course, and I think we have to continue uh, looking backwards, because History, we should not forget history, history, historical facts. But also, there is a time coming uh, that we have to go from looking backward to looking forward. Looking forward. And that is perhaps also a part of the agenda uh, for this third uh, uh, part of today's symposium. Uh, looking forward. And in fact, Jure, uh, uh, said uh, this morning uh, in one sentence as, as when he was uh, re responding to a question uh, that in going trying to go forward um, uh, 1982 uh, diminished the chances for negotiations and so on so that was a heavy setback uh, to a certain extent and so uh, also what can be done in the area of, uh, of confidence building? Confidence building uh, is that uh, uh, I always favored, although that is implied and perhaps uh, said also, but it, it should be made sure uh, that, um, uh, uh, that there is, is confidence building, uh, that, that uh, an, 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 an reaffirmation that the use of force is not a uh, solution to the question and to, uh, to many other questions. Um, and so we uh, are also looking forward in, in a perhaps different climate. We had the, the Brexit in, 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 of the UK, which I think is for many a disaster. And, and also for the uh, population of the, of the inhabitants of the of the Malvinas of the Falkland Islands in its present state, uh, uh, we had also uh, a new government. We have a new government in Argentina. What does that mean uh, compared with uh, the previous government? Um, I was uh, a paper reached me also these days, and uh, that is also maybe contributing to the climate, but. Uh, that was this so-called joint 
communicate between uh, the United Kingdom and Argentina. That was uh, uh, published, this communique, uh, less than a month ago, on the 13th of 14, 13th, 14th of September. So what are the potentials there? Or is it, uh, or is it just a smoke screen? Or, or what is it? A smoke, smoke screen of nice words. We know that in the United Nations there are many smoke screens of nice words there. But also it is an organization I would not like to lose. And, and uh, I'm still uh, very satisfied that uh, uh, it uh, survived much longer and is, and is continued to survive the League of Nations. Now, um, but <laughs> I, I should not continue to talk myself, but it is now the moment for <laughs> our uh, panelists uh, to come forward. And I would like to, uh, to introduce now um, Mark Besley. You have already uh, taken the floor on a few occasions today. Yeah, I feel like I'm a token Britishman here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, uh, 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 um, uh, you have uh, uh, also presented here, uh, that was only uh, for my information, uh, uh, in interesting biographical information, and uh, uh, you are very much, as, as the French say, nourri dans le serail. Uh, French is as bad as my uh, Dutch. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Mark is, um, is a, a PhD candidate at the University of Nottingham, and um, he is there being supervised by Professor White and Professor Tiva Kumaram. And um, his thesis uh, is entitled The Pacific Settlement of the Falkland Malvinas Dispute, The Significance of Stability, International Law and History. Um, and uh, he, an article of his is, is forthcoming within the Finnish yearbook uh, of international law. Finland has many treasures uh, and are scholars. Uh, and, uh, and also it, it is on the issue of Otipis Posidetes. Uh, uh, the, um, which was also mentioned this morning uh, on, on, on more than one occasion. And uh, it played also a role in the Netherlands colonial history uh, uh, when uh, Indonesia, and that is a separate subject I'm not going into, but claimed also a sovereignty over, over West, uh, West Papua. And uh, sometimes claiming in the name of self-determination, claiming some, uh, some progress and justice, it may also constitute a great deal of injustice as it happened uh, to uh, the population of West Papua uh, now. Uh, and I uh, learned a great deal from, at that time, who was later, was also a judge at uh, the Tokyo Tribunal, Dutch judge, uh, Professor Röhling, uh, whom I admire a great deal. And, and, uh, but he also uh, invoked the law of Otiposidetis, uh, because he, he um, lined up on the Indonesian side, as I did, because you thought on, you are good and progressive. I was a, a young uh, uh, assistant at the foreign ministry at that time, in the early 60s of uh, the last century. Now, sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, I was speaking about um, about Mark. And Mark, uh, now I, I, <laughs> uh, he completed, and that is the last thing, uh, which is on my biographical information, but he certainly could add many other things. But he completed a book review for the Human Rights Law Review on uh, T.S. Allen's text, the Chaikos Island, Chaikos Chaikos Island. Island and International Law. And most recently, and I should congratulate uh, Mark, he was appointed as a lecturer in law at the uh, Nottingham Law School. You have the floor. Thank you. I'm trying to start with the standard policy now. I think I'll start. Um, so initially, I should probably, I want to add a little bit more to my uh, introduction there. I, uh, I got into uh, Maastricht last night at about half past two in the morning. 
so I've had very little sleep and I'm functioning purely on caffeine and sugar. Uh, so please bear with me if I start to speed up, if I start to walk around, someone just shimmy me back here and then I'll, and I'll firmly place myself here. Uh, so my, my paper is called The Role of Law in Resolving the Falklands Malvinas Dispute. And um, the way I came to this is that I feel that since We've had the publication of, uh, and, and I, and I apologise for the pronunciation of this name, Isaac, Isaac Arico, and I'm not going to try and pronounce the Spanish title to his, um, to his text from 1885, uh, but since this text there have been numerous attempts to survey and resolve what is, a, is centuries long, the, uh, the, the conflict over the disputed Falklands Malvinas archipelago. Um, what is noteworthy, and what we mentioned previously about, about many of these studies, is that they are firmly based within the parameters of history. Uh, history shaped the dispute, therefore there is a presumption that history will resolve the dispute. This contribution, which I'm providing right now, um, to this question of the sovereignty dispute, is distinct from these. I don't plan to peer back into history in attempt to answer the legal questions to where sovereignty should reside. This being said, from a legal perspective, and, and, and as a lawyer, I, I think it's essential that we do assess the factual and legal matrix under the dispute. It's purely that this analysis, which I'm undertaking now, is, is separate from that. I don't want anyone to think that I'm making any I'm saying, normative statements as to how and where sovereignty should, should reside. I, I'm not providing anything of that sort. Um, so, yeah, my own standing and my own legal position is not part of this uh, of this presentation. So, today's presentation considers the future. Uh, it acts to supplement previously produced literature, including my own, um, by assessing the contemporary role of, the, uh, of law in the Pacific settlement of the Falklands Malvinas dispute. To establish this, this presentation is comprised of three primary components. Uh, the first, as is typical in, in works which, we, uh, which address the Falklands dispute, um, I'm going to provide an overview of the contemporary status of the dispute. And I'm quite glad that I, I did provide this, as there, we've seen histories so far of the dispute, and, and as you will see from this, is that every time someone produces the history, it's slightly different. The dispute is so nebulous and so uncertain that you could extract a history however you want that history to be, uh, to be drawn. And this is something which in my thesis I look at and, and I take somewhat a fact-sceptical approach to uh, history in general and, and use of dispute resolution. Um, the second aspect which I'm going to present on um, is to address mechanisms that exist within international relations and international law um, that might be utilised in order to bring about the Pacific settlement of the dispute. Um, it builds on the work of, uh, of Merrill's and, uh, and I have to say Raimondo, whose uh, your piece uh, addressing the role of the UN in relation to the dispute was, was very insightful. Um, then my final section, the focus shifts on... Um, away from what is slightly more doctrinal work into something which is a bit more critical, a bit more theoretical. This is something which I, I confess is I'm working on at the moment and is comprised uh, a large aspect of the final section of my thesis. Um, so I want to emphasise that uh, this is not a fully formed argument, this is something which I'm still playing with in my own mind and I very much welcome comments, feedback and of that sort. Um, so yeah, please, please do provide uh, feedback on that. <coughs> okay, so in assessing the question, its relationship between law and politics in the in the Falklands Malvinas dispute, I will look at whether Koskinyemi's notion of international law as a gentle civilizer of nations could be adopted. And um, mostly speaking on the uh, issue of, of Finnish academics, um, and in this regard, I want to look at whether when political regimes collapse, when we have political change, which we may have had at the moment with Brexit the change in political regime in Argentina, whether this enables law to play a greater role in the, uh, in the establishment of emergent political relationships. And uh, so this is my introduction, and this is generally what I'm going to be following, and, and from there I'll follow and, uh, and I'll provide the first stage of my uh, presentation. So, clearly, the dispute over the uh, territory is one of long-standing, with the history surrounding the contemporary dispute going back over the centuries. Both parties claim exclusive sovereign title, which has resulted in the dispute having evolved into one that is often labelled as being an intractable in character. This is to say that there would appear to be no clear 
legal or political answer to the disputes that would critically be accepted by both parties. It seems to be a zero-sum game. It's you have territory or you don't have the territory. It's as simple as that. Um, the intractable nature of the dispute should not mean that the resolution of the dispute should be shied from. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't try and resolve it. It just means that there will be problems in, this, in regard to this. Um, so that I want to emphasize that this recognition doesn't mean that it is impossible to solve, but purely that we have to strive for different mechanisms and approaches to international law in order to resolve it. So this presents challenges for political leaders and lawyers, and this is something which I want to try and address now. Um, and then before I progress on to that, I want to provide my, uh, my own interpretation of the uh, contemporary status of, of the uh, territory. The UN has recognized the existence of a dispute over the territory between the UK and Argentina, and it classifies the islands as a non-self-governing territory. There are questions, obviously, whether or not they are still non-self-governing. I'm uncertain myself about those, but that's a different story in of itself. Uh, the territory under dispute is currently held by the United Kingdom. Uh, within UK national law, the islands are deemed a British overseas territory. The UK claims long-lasting title to the territory through discovery and acquired by settlements and is treated such in accordance with the British, British Settlement Act of 18, 1887 and 1945. Bolstering this claim to have discovered the territory, the UK argues that the wishes of the territory's population uh, should not be ignored via as, as we've discussed here today, there's been the purported application, and I use the term purported intentionally because it's not been proven and it's yet to ever be proven um, whether or not the application of self-determination was legitimate and of significance in that instance. And, and in regard to this, though, it is worth noting, as again I want to emphasize that 99.8% of the population did vote for the maintenance of the current state territorial status. So even if we've not yet proven that self-determination is apply, the statement that it provided is still one that is particularly significant. Um, to the disputant state, Argentina, the islands are referred to as the Malvinas, and uh, title to the territory is claimed as a result of a number of, uh, a number of factors. Um, as we've discussed uh, previously today, utiposiditis, uh, doctrine the application of that, is the primary mechanism. Um, as the as Argentina acquired territory upon the secession of the Argentinian uh, region uh, from the Spanish colonial uh, entity at that time. It is argued that Spain itself acquired title to the territory either by an application of the uh, papal bull Intercetra. I'm sure my pronunciation is terrible. And, uh, and you're shaking your head, but I think it's actually really quite interesting to see what the legal significance of that was. And I think it's actually very interesting. It's usually disregarded, and I'd love to have a one-to-one -one chat with you about that. Um, also via discovery, and arguably from the acquisition of the territory from France. Um, the significance of the islands to the Argentinian peoples reaffirmed in 1994 with the incorporation um, within the state constitution stating that the Argentine nation ratifies its legitimate and non-prescribing non sovereignty over the Malvinas, Georges del Sur and Sandwich del Sur Islands over the corresponding maritime and, maritime and insular zones as they are an integral part of the national territory. The recovery of said territories and the full exercise of sovereignty, respectful of the life of their inhabitants and according to the principles of international law, are a permanent and unrelinquishing goal of the Argentine people. Further highlighting the significance of the place of the territorial dispute within the Argentine national psyche, the 2nd of April, has been deemed a national holiday, um, Malvinas Day, in order to commemorate the start of the Falklands War in 1982. In addition to the place of the Falklands Malvinas within international law, um, successive Argentine governments have uh, they've lobbied the, government, uh, the United Nations insisting that Malvinas should be recorded as the true name of the territory. And finally, it would be remiss of me to, uh, not to mention uh, the armed um, conflict of 1982 between the UK and Argentina, whereby Argen uh, well, the Argentine military was able to briefly control the territory before being expelled by a British military force. It is appreciated that this is a very brief scan of the history, and, uh, and I'm sure I could talk for hours and hours about this, but I want to, uh, I want to cut it short there. But what I'm hoping that I've done is that I've established that there are these two 
almost entrenched polar positions which we can see. Um, and there seems to be a stagnation almost in the relationship between the two nations in, in regard to uh, the uh, dispute itself and negotiations in that sense. Um, so we have this dispute. And the states are obligated um, to overcome this, this entrenchment. Um, indeed, Article 2.3 of the UN Charter necessitates that disputes are solved by peaceful means. With, and with Article 33, subsection 1 of the UN Charter, noting that the parties to any disputes, the continuance of which is likely to en uh, endanger the maintenance of international peace and security, shall first of all be, uh, they shall seek a solution by negotiation, me uh, inquiry, mediation, conciliation, arbitration, judicial settlement, and so on. This list was restated and re-emphasized by the UN General Assembly in Resolution 2625. Consequently, I'm just going to get a drink. Consequently, um, this, the next section of my paper uh, goes on to address and assess the functionality of the uh, differing approaches uh, to dispute settlements. And uh, I will analyze those in brief, obviously given time, um, but the focus of it will be adjudication and negotiation. Um, for the sake of clarity, I'm going to go through these in a bit of a list-like uh, fashion. So initially, I want to assess the, uh, the form of dispute settlement which is considered to be a binding settlement, namely judicial settlement. Um, the prime candidates for a judicial body which might hear the dispute would seem to be the International Court of Justice. However, significant hurdles would arguably preclude preclude, if I can talk, uh, preclude the dispute from being found on the docket of the court. Initially, there is the issue um, as to the court's limited jurisdiction when it comes to contentious cases. For the court to have jurisdiction, both parties to the dispute are required to have accepted the court's jurisdiction, either on an ad hoc basis or to have accepted the court's compulsory jurisdiction. The UK may have signed up to the ICJ's so-called optional clause, contained with Article 36, Subsection 2 of the ICJ Statute, but it has done so stipulating several reservations, and these reservations would likely add to restrict the, uh, the, the optional clause's applicability to the Falklands Malvinas dispute. A further hurdle is that Argentina has not signed up to the optional clause. In addition, it is highly doubtful that either state would accept the jurisdiction of the court in this contentious, in this contentious case. Um, there's such a high degree of factual uncertainty that surrounds a dispute, and, and the stakes at the heart of it would, would likely lead states, any state that was in this position, to be allowed to, to gamble away in this zero-sum game. So in addition to the question of jurisdiction, there is the issue as to whether the court could actually hear the decision based on the merits. Um, in regard to this, it must be mentioned that the courts are, the courts are legal institutions, and they normally have no right to decide political questions. Therefore, the ICJ is sought to implement a two-stage test almost um, in order to assess whether it should be precluded from, from hearing a case based on the political nature of a dispute. The first aspect is that if the question cannot be resolved by legal criteria, then unless the court's competence has been extended by agreement, it must decline to adjudicate. The second is linked to the first, in that if a case raises a question of international law, then to fulfill its function, the course must give a decision, irrespective of the political context. For example, within the Aegean Sea Continental Shelf case, which has previously been mentioned, um, the court held that a dispute involving two states in respect to their, con uh, to their continental shelf can hardly fail but have some political context. But, the court continued, it was clear um, from the parties' arguments that the dispute between them involved a conflict as to their respective rights. Therefore, it was determined um, that the, uh, the legal rights lied at the root of this dispute. <clears throat> a similar point was raised, uh, raised by the court in the United States Diplomatic and Council Staff Interim Judgment. Therefore, I'd feel that it is safe to say that the Falklands Malvinas dispute, with its roots firmly, in the legal issues to where territorial titles should reside, would be heard by the court on that basis. This being said, the jurisdictional issue which I've just raised a moment ago 
would appear to be an insurmountable one. But critically, even if the dispute did find its way to the court's docket and that of any other judicial body, is there actually any guarantee that the losing state will accept the judgment of that court? Consequently, I feel that we need to assess the, uh, the viability of less binding mechanisms to aid with dispute settlement. Perhaps an inquiry or conciliation uh, might prove effective, especially so when undertaken in relation with additional non-binding forms of dispute settlement, such as negotiations. The inquiry might prove to be a catalyst for further negotiations. But substantial hurdles limit the likelihood of this occurring. Principally, the inquiry would be required to, to have support of both the UK and Argentina. Otherwise, it will face major issues regarding the acceptance of its findings. A further issue, uh, further issue is that there are likely to be significant problems with regard to establishing the parameters of the inquiry, with the UK and Argentina both desiring the inquiry to focus on particularly favourable issues and for it to ignore ones less favourable. However, unlike with the issues of jurisdiction, which plague the process of adjudication, the non-legally non binding nature of the inquiry might make the parties more likely to accept the creation of one and for the inquiry to have a wider level of competence. Um, moving on from the process of inquiry, I now want to assess the uh, dispute resolution process of negotiation. And this would seem to be the UN's uh, preferred mode of resolving the dispute, with the General Assembly, uh, General Assembly re recommending resolution 2065 that negotiations should take place. The voting outcome for this was pretty unequivocal, with 94 states to zero states voting in favour of only 14 abstaining. Um, so it is clear that negotiation is the preferred mechanism. But what should this entail? Um, negotiations are normally conducted through diplomatic channels, as I'm sure you're very aware. Um, this is via diplomats, foreign office representatives, and so on. Negotiations may be undertaken on an ad hoc basis or with the establishment of a commission. In the alternative, we have summit-type discussions whereby heads of state or high-ranking um, foreign office ministers may meet in order to break a deadlock. Often, summit meetings are the culmination of lower-level negotiations. Indeed, the effectiveness of these summit forums should not be overstated, though. And, in, and the, uh, the increased public attention which a summit meeting may draw may actually, um, in essence, reignite the political aspects of the dispute. So I feel there should be a degree of cautiousness in, in regard to those. Um, returning to the more basic form of negotiation, one of the key issues with regard to effectiveness um, in resolving a dispute is that the relative strength of negotiations is more likely to be representative of power disparities than it is to represent the strengths of legal arguments. However, I feel that we should try and mitigate for this disparity in strengths by arguably including third party mediators. Um, clearly, though, negotiation has failed to produce the peace or resolution that the dispute has desired and which we do all desire, and the intractable nature of the dispute is still very much alive. So it is felt that the process of negotiation needs to be taken into consideration with other forms of, uh, of dispute settlement, so mediators, an inquiry perhaps, and, uh, and these may all form some form of holistic approach which uh, could result in some form of dispute resolution. Um, however, even if we do accept that negotiations could be successful, I still feel it is necessary that we, uh, that we go on to assess the role that law might play in these negotiations and whether law can facilitate dispute settlement within a negotiated uh, agreement. So in any negotiation, it cannot be disputed that the relatively more powerful state will have greater leverage in the negotiations, as just stat stated. Um, however, it, I feel that it might be possible for international law to mitigate somewhat for the implications of power disparity. International law, as Habermas said, provides the rules of the game. But what does this mean? Um, for Stephen Wheatley of Lancaster University, this would seem to denote that once international relations are framed in terms of law, they will operate within the interdisciplinary constraints of an interpretive community. Okay. It is this notion of community within which the disputant states are acting out their arguments during the negotiations that cannot to mitigate for this power in law. Law plays a largely pragmatic role meaning that law tends to preserve, uh, serve the purpose of the state with politics, 
determining whether a new treaty is created, for example, or whether new Security Council resolutions is adopted. This is very reflective of the past few decades in relation to the Falklands Malvinas dispute. However, when we have instances of radical political change, law can take a more central role in shaping, shaping politics. In these instances, international law can act as a constraint on political discretion. This, as White continued to argue in his uh, text addressing the Cuban blockade, signifies that within a new political context, international law might provide the parameters within which political action might occur. However, and I do want to add this word of caution here, we need to be conscious of the fact that international law not, may not always prove to be rigid enough to fully constrain the political ambitions of the disputing state. This is perhaps where the additional guiding hand of a third party mediator may prove um, to be invaluable assistant to the gentle civilizer of nations. And proving rather timely in this instance, as we've already mentioned today, is that both the UK and Argentina have recently undergone significant political change. It remains to be seen what the impact might be of these in the longer term, especially in relation to Brexit. I think the repercussions of that could be pretty huge um, in both not just the regional level but on the international level as well. Um, but we also have the September joint communique from the UK and Argentina. And is this communique indicative of one of these moments of political change and how it's uh, been able to foster some, and our law has been able to foster some form of movement in negotiations? Um, so they may have not been negotiations in relation to sovereignty, but I'm hopeful that this is the, uh, the first stage in some form of progress towards some form of uh, dispute settlement overall. And I'd like to conclude there. Thank you very much. Our apology as, uh, as Mark just before me, because I think I'm just as sleep deprived as he is, for a different reason. <laughs> yeah, that's about it. Yeah, because um, I fell ill with a cold uh, uh, just a, a couple of days ago, and then I continued teaching, and after that I need to prepare this presentation. So it's not going to be as structured as I had hoped, but I still hope it will be illuminating in some way or the other. Um, but yeah, it's going to be more about um, uh, yeah, geopolitical factors and with an occasional excursion into law. Um, but I think that fits nicely with, uh, first of all, what Mark has been just been telling us. Also, hopefully, it will help to place everything that we've been talking about at this very interesting symposium into a, a wider context. Um, and we are going to do that by relating everything to uh, to one country, which. Um, at first glance has nothing to do whatsoever with the Falcons or Malvinas, which is China, uh, or as one um, US presidential candidate would pronounce it, China, but I, I'll just say China. If, if you... <laughs> <laughs> but before I do that, um, also because I realize that I'm the last speaker and uh, you know people are maybe longingly looking towards the exit, I will start with a little anecdote. Um, because, yeah, as Professor von both mentioned in my biography, I served um, for Bosnia and Herzegovina at the uh, International Court of Justice. That's also uh, in the case of Bosnia versus Serbia. You would also not really expect the uh, Falklands or Malvinas to come up there. But uh, for some reason, actually, it was mentioned during the oral hearings in the proceedings. And um, because uh, at a certain point, Serbia thought it might be a good idea to call up as an expert um, witness the, um, the commander of UN Pro 4 in Sarajevo for a year during the Bosnian War, uh, General Sir Michael Rose, otherwise also known as a veteran of the Falklands War of uh, 1982. And then upon, during the cross-examination, when um, uh, Council for Bosnia was going to ask him about the nature of the conflict uh, in Bosnia between the Bosnian Serbs and uh, the Bosnian government army, uh, she asked him to qualify because he had used in his book the word territorial war to qualify it. And so she asked him to describe it and she very carefully took a very distant example in history. She said like, well, is it like Napoleon, for example, invading Spain and Portugal and other countries to acquire more territory? Is that what you're calling a territorial war? I'm quoting now, is that right? And then uh, General Sir Michael Rose answered, uh, yes, then I made the parallel here with Iraq invading Kuwait, where quite clearly one nation had invaded another. I could have used the Argentines invading the Islas Malvinas rather than that, but I thought that was a bit close to home. 
Um, President Rosalind Higgins then said, well, uh, yeah, that may not have been a prudent example. Uh, anyway, so <laughs> British nationals uh, talking about a completely unrelated case before the ICJ, but uh, yeah, you never know what kind of issues might come up. Okay, I just want to. Sh I've just always wanted to share this with uh, with an audience. So, <laughs> and it was really funny when you were in the room. So, okay, so um, yeah, in fact, um, the entire issue of, uh, of of the Falcons or Malvinas dispute is actually quite relevant, also to China's geopolitical um, position. And I would suggest that this is probably the case for three different reasons, um, and they have to do first of all, with the two main developments which have determined the course of uh, international relations and therefore also international law after the Second World War, which is colonialism and decolonization. Um, I said the Second World War, right? Yeah, and the Cold War. So those are the two. And uh, we will also see how this actually affected the way um, both China and Taiwan conducted themselves uh, during, the, um, uh, during the war in 1982 and subsequently. Um, it is also a bit of a story about how, uh, how the People's Republic of China actually came uh, to its own at the international stage because the, the, the War of 1982 happened quite briefly and uh, quite shortly after the People's Republic of China had kind of resumed uh, a more regular role in the international mainstream because it had joined the United Nations only in 1971 and uh, only started um, having uh, an, an and foreign policy that was not aimed at overthrowing the existing international order from 1980 onwards, more or less. And uh, third of all, uh, there are some obvious parallels in, um, in uh, a coastal state trying to reacquire control over an island that it claims with, uh, with China's interests, both with regard to Taiwan, but also with regard to other disputed islands, most notably those in the South China Sea, although they may not be islands anymore. Um, and also with regard to the uh, Senkaku or Jiaoyu Islands, uh, which are disputed with Japan. So what I will do now first is just to go through those years and describe China's position and its relationship with Argentina, and then um, uh, mention how this has changed, and then um, hopefully draw some conclusions as to what we can learn from this towards the end. So as I said, um, to set the stage, uh, China, the People's Republic of China, was established only in 1949. Um, and um, because there was still a competing government in existence, which fled to Taiwan um, in 1949, and also still claimed to be the legitimate government of China, and does so until this day, um, China was, the People's Republic was, was not immediately recognized as the legal representative. It was, of course, by the socialist countries um, and uh, during the Cold War, and then also um, slowly by a, a large part of the developing world. But it took um, until 1971 before the voting um, patterns in the UN changed sufficiently to allow the People's Republic of China to displace Taiwan, or the Republic of China, as the representative of China in the United Nations. Um, we can note here that in 1972, uh, Argentina then also switched its recognition from the Republic of China to the People's Republic of China. But at that time, when, uh, when the People's Republic jo joined the United Nations, it was still a time of turmoil internally, domestically, uh, because of the Cultural Revolution, which would uh, still last until 1976. So it's, uh, even though from that moment onwards, the People's Republic was a member of the United Nations. It didn't signal an immediate change in Chinese foreign policy. Um, you had a number of very, very timid uh, diplomats taking up place in uh, the, the, the places previously occupied by the representatives of the Republic of China in New York and Geneva, but they basically embarked on what they would later call the learning process, which lasted for over a decade in which they just got to know uh, what the United Nations was all about. And in those years, the statements that China would make would also still be very revolutionary in nature, denouncing Western imperialism and very, very strongly ideological. This only changed in uh, 1978, uh, when basically domestically, under the leadership of Deng Xiaoping, uh, uh, China initiated the reform era and started, um, yeah, ex and basically accepted the existing structures of the international order, including the United Nations, and also started. Um, <coughs> Um, taking a more collaborative stance, but it was still this period of learning that was taking place at the moment. Um, 
it would still remain for a few decades that that China would have a fairly um, fairly um, modest uh, approach to voting in the Security Council because even though it had been uh, become a veto uh, power within the Security Council, uh, it preferred uh, to let the Soviet Union do most of the ideological heavy lifting. It was sometimes also not particularly. Uh, its foreign policy was also not particularly uh, aligned with the Soviet Union. There was a bit of a rivalry going on there as well. But um, even if the socialist world kind of aligned along certain lines, uh, what China would usually do was uh, would be to abstain uh, in voting. Something like that also happened in 1982, uh, when China did support uh, basically the Argentine claim uh, to, to the uh, to the Malvinas, uh, as the Argentina calls them, of course. Um, but didn't do it very, very openly or very, very strongly. So um, what happened in the Security Council is also that, that China abstained from a number of resolutions because they had been sponsored or drafted by the United Kingdom, and therefore the language of those resolutions favored the UK position more than it did uh, the position of Argentina. But at the same time, during, uh, uh, during that time, the, the, both the, what was then known as the Third World, uh, um, and the socialist uh, countries are also kind of divided because uh, of the widespread condemnation of uh, the dictatorship of Argentina, as well as the use of force by Argentina to obtain Ministro uh, Malvinas. We heard this morning already that, that that was also not a very wise move from an international legal point of view. Now, during uh, at the same time, uh, the Republic of China, so Taiwan, was still a bit of a factor uh, in, in uh, in international affairs, definitely much more than it is now, because it still was very mattered quite a lot economically, and the history uh, of it being in the United Nations was still far more recent, and uh, they kind of naturally supported the United Kingdom in that position. You also see in the years after the war that there have, were a number of incidents in which it seemed that uh, Taiwanese fishing ships were sailing in the waters of the of the Falklands or Malvinas, and uh, where and. Uh, there were some altercations, uh, notably one incident with uh, with the Argentine Coast Guard, uh, which was basically enforcing the Argentine claim to uh, to the sea, and well, to the territory and to the sea. So, when did um, when did China really start supporting uh, the Argentine claim? Because it had at, back then it was a bit of like more muffled support. Uh, that only happened uh, basically uh, a decade later. Because uh, China first, um, after it had been kind of accepted into the United Nations and seemed to be uh, having a low profile in international affairs, got into serious trouble in 1989 following the Tiananmen massacre, in which uh, the democracy movement uh, was violently repressed by the Chinese government uh, under the eyes of the world's press, because at the time uh, there were a lot there, because Gorbachev was visiting China. So that really drew attention to China's human rights record and kind of determined the way uh, other states looked, and particularly the Western world, looked at China for the decades to come. Now, from that moment onward, uh, yeah, China was a bit of a pariah and found itself isolated, and this isolation, and basically all of China's diplomacy was aimed at, at uh, breaking this isolation and presenting a kind of a different image of China in the world. Now, one thing that really helped uh, was that the first uh, head of state to visit China again uh, after the Tiananmen massacre was Argentine President Carlos Menem in 1994. So that uh, was um, quite a bit of diplomatic support for China. Now, from that moment onwards, um, because then Chinese uh, officials started making public statements in which they really strongly supported the Argentine claim, um, China has been consistently and regularly making statements in different international fora and also publicly in which it supports um, the, the Argentine position with regards to the Falklands or Malvinas. Now, um, in a way, it's, it's fairly easy also to, to align that with, with uh, China's ideology, uh, although the story that I just drew shows that's, uh, that that's not the only part of it. When I started looking at this topic initially, I, was, I thought like, well, this will just go along ideological lines and the People's Republic of China has uh, had a consistent policy of supporting decolonization and denouncing colonialism. And in the statements, that rhetoric also kind of shines through, but as Professor Van Bouwer said, sometimes those are just beautiful words. Um, it's, uh, 
it was only really, really backed up with more political support basically from the mid 1990s onwards. But then, since then, um, China has been very, very consistent in its support uh, for the Argentine claim. Um, this extends also until the recent statement, which has already been mentioned by some speakers, also in the UN Decolonization Committee, in which the representative of China again shows uh, quite a bit of support for the Argentine claim to the to the Malvinas uh, from the point of view also of uh, decolonization. Um, the question then, of course, is, uh, apart from some of uh, these ideological factors, um, what other reasons might uh, China have to, to be so supportive? Well, one of them is uh, geopolitical considerations, because uh, China has been trying to strengthen its position in the entire South Atlantic, and also with regards uh, to Latin America. Um, it has been, been, this has been uh, a more successful or faster effort with regard to African countries in the South uh, in the South Atlantic and in Latin America it has been a bit slower. One part of this is also uh, uh, diplomatic efforts which have been made uh, throughout the 90s and the 2000s to basically have make countries switch their recognition uh, of the Republic of China on Taiwan to the People's Republic of China and uh, the richer China was getting and the more its economy was developing, the easier this also became. But especially when in Taiwan uh, more independence-minded political parties were in charge, uh, China would strengthen its efforts and also um, um, really hail every new state recognition that they, that they get as a major victory, most notably when this happened with Costa Rica, for example, a few years ago. And at this point, there are only very, very few states left uh, the, who still recognize uh, Taiwan as the legitimate government of, of China. Uh, most of those states recognize uh, the People's Republic. So, um, apart from this kind of geopolitical uh, relevance, also because um, in the South Atlantic you find quite a few resources and China is trying to diversify the, the places where it gets oil, what other interest could there be? Well, the most obvious example, I already mentioned this in the beginning, is that, that uh, from a security and from a strategic perspective, um, the China learned a very big lesson from the way that, there are, that Argentina conducted the, the war in 1982, uh, both for domestic purposes as well as uh, at the, on the geopolitical front. Uh, domestically speaking, it's very clear to the Chinese leadership that if you whip up a nationalist frenzy and, uh, fe and, and, and feed nationalist emotions and then launch a war, you will initially ride a wave of popular support but if you lose that war, then uh, yeah, the support ends quickly and it might cause the downfall of your regime. So at the very least, uh, the leadership in Beijing knows that any territorial claims that it asserts and that it sometimes also defends quite aggressively and also uh, for which it tries to generate support among its population, uh, that it shouldn't really go too far unless it is really, really, really sure that it can win any military conflicts that it would get embroiled in. It also means that it's, uh, that's despite the fact that China sometimes likes to play, uh, play up or uh, to engage in some acts of brinkmanship, it's, it's unlikely that it will actually cross the line into military conflict all too easily as long as it also doesn't really have a very, very great military capacity and it is unclear what other powers might be doing. Um, from a more legal point of view, um, there seem to be some differences because at least, um, yeah, it is clear also from uh, the different accounts that we have heard today that the, there is uh, quite a bit of disagreement about uh, the territorial claims to the Falklands or the Malvinas, whereas um, at least with regard to Taiwan, uh, I think the international law is quite crystal clear, although it might also be disputed by some. Uh, which is that um, as far as the law is concerned, there's still uh, the one China principle which both governments officially respect, both the one in Taipei and the one in Beijing, even though sometimes in Taipei there are governments which uh, are more inclined to, uh, to invoke the right of the Taiwanese to self-determination, which is an, uh, another can of worms and probably would merit an entire symposium in and of itself, so I'm not going to get into detail on that. But... Um, but at the same time, it seems that there the, the, the claim for that, uh, that the People's Republic would make that it is just basically uh, reoccupying its rightful territory is stronger than uh, the one that Argentina might have. 
uh, with regard to other islands that uh, that uh, China disputes with Japan and with countries in the South China Sea, that might be a little bit more uh, problematic. So, um, but another lesson that that we can maybe draw is that uh, the widespread condemnation of Argentina in 1982, even by countries um, that were quite sympathetic to its claim over the the Malvinas or Falklands, is uh, that it is really, and as Professor uh, Cohen also said this morning, it really uh, is not a good idea to uh, use force uh, to assert a claim even if you think that you have a legitimate one, because it might also result in a widespread condemnation within the United Nations and, uh, in addition, also diplomatic isolation. So, um, I think that is basically uh, a short bird's eye view of the uh, of the Chinese perspective on this entire dispute that I would give. Um, but I'm happy uh, to, well, for example, be corrected by Professor von Boven because part of the history that I just described is something that he has lived through from up close. So um, maybe he will also tell me where I went wrong. And I'm also very open to, to questions, obviously, from the room. And just one small note uh, about sovereignty. I don't know if we're going to talk about that, but because I did actually publish something about that, but more from a Chinese point of view. And yeah, indeed, uh, meaning uh, it's a very important principle uh, to the People's Republic of China as well, and uh, really emphasized also in its foreign policy, and notably in what it considers its big contribution to international law, the five principles of peaceful coexistence. But I think uh, actually just like self-determination, uh, there is quite uh, the notion of sovereignty may be so loose that it's not going to help all that much in, uh, in resolving any future disputes. So I think I'll just leave it at this. Indeed, in fact, I, I do have uh, uh, special uh, feelings or experiences with regard to Taiwan. Uh, as long as I uh, did some work for the United Nations, of course, uh, I would not like to complicate my work, which was already complicated, but further by uh, bringing in uh, the, the whole Taiwan issue uh, in my work. And so uh, at that time, I uh, uh, politely, uh, when I was solicited for call for, for by Taiwan universities to come and, and see and, and work with them, I thought it was perhaps doing harm to other activities uh, which uh, I was carrying out. When you see now uh, the younger generation of, of, of students in, in Taiwan, they are very aware of their own identity and they don't care whether it is called China or, or, or others, but Taiwan is for them, uh, I think, uh, has a special meaning. Any questions or observations? Yeah. Thank you very much, Theo. Well, this morning I, I spoke about the, the past, uh, about the history, the competing claims. And when you refer to territorial sovereignty disputes all over the world, by necessity you have to look at the past, right? because uh, legal title yeah. Uh, are created through facts, different kinds of events, legal acts that by necessity uh, occurred during a given lapse of time. Um, but the dean, the message of the dean uh, this morning was she was willing to have a Maastricht solution for the dispute. Obviously, uh, I'm not from Maastricht, I'm not in a position to give that solution. But I would, I would like also to refer uh, to the future. Uh, um, I think the past, the present and the future are uh, inextricably linked. So you cannot envisage a future solution without taking into account what happened in the past. Um, even uh, in Africa, they say, when you don't know where you go, uh, look where you come from. And this is, in my view, applicable to this uh, particular dispute, as well as others. So, in my view, there must be a way 
uh, to conciliate different interests that are present in this situation. This morning, I exclusively referred to the territorial sovereignty issue. And I gave my own view, obviously it is just my view, uh, about territorial sovereignty. And I believe that the Argentine position is, is uh, very strong uh, with regard to territorial sovereignty. And this is probably the reason why uh, Argentina has, uh, has support. Internationally speaking, Ar Argentina has more support than, than the United Kingdom in its legal position. Uh, I also referred to the question of self-determination, and I said uh, there is, obviously there is a reality, which is uh, the inhabitants of this territory, because of this uh, migratory control of the uh, administering power, uh, are essentially British. And is it impossible to conciliate the interests of all concerned? My answer is no. So there must be a way in, in English, one says, uh, when there is a will, there is a way. And I believe there must be a way. Obviously, this requires uh, that uh, all parties concerned agree to discuss and to try to find a solution. Uh, I'm aware that the stronger is probably less willing to discuss, because when you have the strong position and you are in the control of the territory, you may have less interest uh, in, in settling the dispute. But the maintenance of a dispute creates problems for everybody. And I believe it won't be a rational solution uh, to keep the dispute uh, open for the future generations. So what, in my view, would be this approach, a positive approach, would be to take into account uh, what happened in the past, uh, the, situa the legal situation with regard to territorial sovereignty, and the fact that uh, the current population of the islands uh, are British. So the, and there are, there are solutions that, are, uh, are, that can be found even uh, in other parts of the world. So, um, the last uh, intervention, uh, Vim, you spoke about uh, Taiwan, but uh, Hong Kong, the way the United Kingdom uh, and the PRC settled the Hong Kong issue, could be used as an example. I'm not saying we have to make exact copy, but uh, uh, if you imagine a, a special uh, self-governed region in the islands with their own legislation, their own currency, uh, even a custom union, um, language, etc., etc., etc. Like uh, it was foreseen for Hong Kong in the 1994 agreement. So you have uh, one country, two systems, that was the idea, but they were thinking about uh, economic social systems. Here it's something different, but uh, you, may, you may find a solution that, that could uh, go in that direction. Obviously, this requires uh, that uh, all sides have uh, to make concessions, and probably this is the, more, the most difficult thing. Just a comment, thank you. Thank you very much. Marcelo, any other? Yes, please. Hello to everybody. Um, I've been already spotted of Nicholas from the Embassy of Argentina. Yeah. Um, I'd like to, first of all, personally thank the University of Maastricht and Fabian Raimondo, professor, for organizing this uh, very interesting uh, seminar. Uh, it's proven uh, that it has brought up extremely interesting uh, ideas and we will definitely take that back to study them and hopefully this will plant the seed for a Maastricht solution for uh, 
the international recognized dispute. Um, anybody who's uh, interested in knowing the official position of, uh, of Argentina can look it up at uh, every year at the, uh, well, it's posted mostly everywhere, but it's in uh, every year we, we present it in the Committee of uh, Decolonization uh, uh, where we planned that we state our official position. And it goes, it's been said already here that uh, it goes very much in line with what the UN General Assembly in 2065, in 1965 with the resolution 2065, stated that we want to uh, solve this international recognized uh, sovereign dispute by peaceful uh, means and negotiations. And that is a state policy and that's what we hope to uh, achieve uh, with the help of uh, all the countries. And uh, that position uh, has received uh, and continues to receive full support from many countries in the world. And last comment, uh, we have two uh, official anniversaries for Malvinas in our country. One is April 2nd, which commemorates the fallen uh, in the war, and uh, the 10th of June, which commemorates the establishment of the political uh, commandancy in Malvinas in 1829, which was uh, stated by uh, a professor in the morning, uh, and it is one of the many exercises of sovereignty that, we, that the country did in, at that time. Thank you, Professor. Well, thank you very much for uh, your kind words and encouraging ideas. Uh, are there any other points or observations? Well, um, if not, then I, I, I would like to say that I, I, I fully agree with the notion that uh, we should, when taking positions now or working for positions, uh, we cannot ignore the past, uh, certainly not. Uh, and uh, that is not only here for the Malvinas question, but for many other issues, also pertaining to, uh, to Argentina. Uh, and also, I, I think that from, from recognizing uh, what has been happening in the past and so on, uh, we can work towards the future. And, uh, and for uh, 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 settlement, uh, uh, of the uh, sovereignty dispute. There are certain ideas also in my mind uh, how, uh, because I, I do not have a Limburg uh, solution, I, I must uh, admit, uh, uh, um, but uh, fortunately we, we do have uh, a dean and, and, and others who, who come up uh, with that idea and so we should try to, to work in that direction, although uh, we cannot uh, exaggerate our limited in influence uh, we have. Uh, so, um, but um, one of the things that uh, uh, is coming all the time also in my mind is this settlement of the sovereignty dispute. Is that a precondition for other arrangements or is it a process that may go hand in hand with other practical arrangements as well. Uh, so, and or so, um, I, I believe that both processes working uh, for uh, the settlement of the sovereignty dispute and other arrangements should go hand in hand, <coughs> and and, and uh, uh, on both sides of the parties. Now. Um, and we may uh, give it further thought also. Uh, perhaps we, we do have a small study group uh, relating, it is not a, a campaign, an action group, but a study group. And uh, I think we should also try uh, to work on that, uh, on that level. Um, we have uh, not been working at the level as some of the European parliamentarians did the other day beating each other up. Well, we, we, 
uh, we have been uh, fortunately above that level. Uh, but this is, uh, this is not only a serious uh, remark. But um, I would like, uh, instead, because we are c coming to, a, uh, to an end of, 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 of this, um, um, uh, this symposium, and I would like, uh, first of all, um, once again, thank all the panelists this morning and all day for their contribution. So thank you so much for, uh, I think it was a, a successful uh, symposium uh, with uh, uh, an academic level uh, uh, which is, is, is more than uh, adequate. Um, now, uh, so I think the, uh, would like also to thank the panelists for their contributions. And uh, in fact, I, 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 for all of you who came here, because uh, this is a Maastricht symposium, but I think the majority of the uh, participants here come from other places, uh, other countries, and other corners, and, and, and universities. So uh, I think that is also uh, very useful. and. Um, we are not locking ourselves up, but uh, working uh, together on these kind of issues. And um, also, I was pleased to see that the two <coughs> award winners of the uh, essay contest, that they came here, and uh, once again also uh, I congratulate them for uh, their accomplishments. And certainly, uh, Fabian, you deserve uh, a lot of praise to have organized this over a considerable period of time, because I remember that you started working on this in consultation with uh, the, the others from the study group, but you have started for quite a long time. And uh, uh, I, I, I thank you once again. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm not, I do not have gifts or presents or can play in the Santa Claus, but, uh, but uh, uh, thank, thanks, thanks again. And I would like also to thank uh, for the, uh, the team uh, that uh, uh, was helpful in, in, in making all the arrangements of this symposium. So, uh, uh, and that brings us uh, to the end of our uh, uh, symposium, and I declare it to be closed. Thank you. Thank you.